In this exciting episode, it's intrigue on the high seas as Hugh Marlowe goes nautical. If that's not enough of a hard sell, could I interest you in a defendant who's James Deaning out of control? It's only a matter of time before I start singing, we all live in a slandered submarine. You'll see it all in the Navy. It's Perry Mason, Season 3, Episode 23, The Case of the Slandered Submarine. Welcome to the Perry Pod. I'm your humble host, Jonathan Searcy. My purpose here, pretty simple, offer an audio companion to every episode of television's greatest legal drama, Perry Mason. I plan to record a pod for every episode of this television series, including the made-for-TV movies. We're making our way through the television series by following the original airing order. In this episode, you'll get a plot summary. I give you some trivia before I tackle the episode's theme. Then I give you a Perry proverb, a pearl of wisdom from the man himself, before we relax at the water cooler, where just like Perry, Della, and Paul, we can discuss the ins and outs of our favorite legal cruise adventures. But first, say it with me to the law library. <laughs> Each episode in the Law Library, I tackle some legal conundrum raised by the episode in question so that we can have fresh insight for future cases. In this trip to the Law Library, we investigate the conundrum of how to sue the U.S. Navy. Mr. Mason, I understand that you're the only man in California with the necessary qualifications for the legal action that I have in mind. What legal action, Mr. Belden? To institute a suit against the United States Navy. Tell us why you're skeptical, Perry. Well, common law holds that a government body is immune to suit, providing its activities remain within the strict purviews of governmental affairs. Perry's referring to what's called sovereign immunity, a doctrine that says the government can't be sued without its permission. My question, is this true? Man, we're already in Paul Prompt territory, but let's take a look. Again, I'm no legal scholar, but a quick Google search shows me that just last month, the U.S. Navy was found guilty of copyright infringement in order to pay software company Bit Management Software over $150,000. The lawsuit dates back to 2016 when Bit Management accused the Navy of illegally installing 3D virtual reality software onto hundreds of thousands of computers without permission. So yes, you can sue, and apparently defeat the Navy in court. The pertinent piece of legislation here is the Federal Tort Claims Act, a law that allows people to sue the U.S. government if they've been injured by the wrongful actions of a government employee. In the past, people could not sue the government without its permission, but the FTCA changed all that. Pertinent facts, you can only sue the government for the damages allowed in state tort law. Two, the government has more protections than a normal defendant. And three, the cases are generally heard by a judge not a jury, you heard. I also received a note from our show's unofficial legal counsel, listener Tom Wiltshire, about the Uniform Code of Military Justice. He tells us that it contained Miranda warning rights 10 years before the Moran decision came down from the U.S. Supreme Court. Unlike the civilian application of the rights, Article 31B stipulates the rights attach the moment a service member is suspected of a crime. In civilian life, Miranda warning rights only attach to suspects held in custody. I love it. Thanks for the deep dive, Tom. Now, let's get to the plot of this episode. The Case of the Slandered Submarine. The USS Murray. It's a sub in the U.S. Navy. You better roll those snare drums. Naval intelligence wants to know who murdered Dolores Chapman, a woman associated with many men on the Murray, if you know what I mean. Still clueless? Ask Chief Scott. Well, uh, any of you fellas ever make any time with her? Well, nobody's admitting it now, you know, what with her murder and all, but, uh... 
You could say I was a close friend. Why else do we care about the Murray? Why, because our boy Hugh Marlowe, a.k.a. Captain Jim Page, is using it to test some exciting new technology. How's naval research? What are you doing back on the old submarine? I'm the project officer. We're moving out on the Alpha Electronic Test tomorrow. Apparently, a lot of money rests on getting this government contract. But don't try to buy off Captain Jim, especially when you're sporting a tube like the one Gordon Russell's got on. I see you, Aaron Hubble. Now, look, Commander. I've spent a lot of money in the development of this device, and I'm prepared to spend more. Russell, you know better than try to buy a favorable report. Also, it appears Captain Jim's wife may be a mole. Apparently, one of the companies trying to get the Navy contract is now owned by Captain Jim's papa-in-law. Intrigue! Why didn't you tell me? You know I'm testing their equipment. The Navy could take a dim view of a contract awarded on my recommendation to my father-in-law. Oh, Jim. Alpha Electronics wasn't purchased with the intention of trading on our relationship. It happens to be the hub of a projected $300 million enterprise. Where does father-in-law Belden head for redress against his obstinate son-in-law? Perry's, of course. We documented that request in our law library visit. Well, the legal mystery, plus a hefty retainer, quite enough to get Paul and Perry on the case. Meanwhile, on the sub, mystery. We get slivers of glass and some shoes that point to Dolores Chapman's murderer, then we get another murder. Most foul, a screwdriver to the heart of Captain Jim. Hugh Marlowe, no! We're all ready, sir. Sir? Commander Pay. Back on land, Mason and Drake show up just in time to see Private Robert Chapman walked off in cuffs. Mason has a talk with Belden, gives Mr. Cash back his hefty retainer. In the car, Perry makes a discovery. Would you be interested in representing Robert Chapman? Any signature? No. Nope. Could be Della's unidentified caller. These bills are new and numbered consecutively. Now Perry's defending Robert Chapman, and Chapman's got a confession to make. Oh, I knew her. Maybe not as well as some of the others did, but then I was only her husband. Perry checks out the scene of Dolores' murder and gets some info from the landlord. Next, Perry and Paul investigate the bar Dolores frequented, the Aloha Cafe, and discover who's been feeding Perry cash. It's Chief Scott. Tell him what you know, Chief. At $5,000 was a down payment for a half interest in the Aloha. We were going to buy it from Julio. Who's the weed? Who was buying the other half interest? Dolores Chapman. She was the main attraction in the place. Having her as a partner would have been good business. We head to the trial and get the basic outline of the case. Edward Platt's the prosecutor. Hello, Chief Perry. Mason maintains that whoever killed Dolores also killed Captain Jim. Furthermore, the person who killed them both did so because of the results of the DevCo tests. Who was Dolores's partner? That would be Russell, the Alpha Electronics CEO. Quick, check that man's eyesight. Your glasses were broken by her frantic effort to avoid being strangled by you. When you left her house that night, you were driving blind, Mr. Russell, glare blind. About as blind as you were a few minutes ago when you couldn't see the picture of that accident. An audio-only medium doesn't do the test justice. And I'm talking about the tube test that Russell had to undergo under Perry's scathing cross-examination. The Naval Intelligence Officer jokes that the men might change the name of the Moray to Mason. Paul wants to get a little more water time in. One of these days, I'm going to take a nice, long sea voyage. Any particular place? Uh, just anywhere. I haven't made up my mind yet. The um, commander knows the slogan that might help you. Oh, well, what's that? Join the Navy and see the world. Now, let's get trivial, shall we? 
Each episode in our trivia section, I give you three takeaways. A Paul is a subject worth investigating more. Adela is trivia about an actor or actress featured in our episode. And a Perry, well, it's a piece of pertinent info we learn about our intrepid hero. Our Paul is about Paul. As the episode ends, the naval intelligence officer slings a slogan at our favorite private investigator. You just heard it. Join the Navy. See the world. You can see it coming a mile away. Poor Paul's too busy sticking his eye to a magnifying glass or perhaps a liquor-filled glass to see it coming, though. Side note, what do you think Paul's sipping when he meets Perry at the Aloha Cafe? That's a bonus Paul prompt for you. Anywho, do a deep dive on the Join the Navy, See the World. Official slogan, when did it enter the lexicon? See what you find. And here's another one while I'm thinking about it. Which actress portrayed Dolores Chapman. It's like a Laura Palmer Twin Peaks situation. A character is dead but haunts the action on screen. But alas, no screen credit for whoever supplied the pictures. Who is she? Ardella for this episode is none other than Prosecutor Commander Driscoll, a.k.a. Edward Platt. As this appears to be part of defense counsel's previous line of questioning, prosecution will withhold its objections pending the court's ruling as to the admissibility of the testimony in the presentation. Here's 10 about Ed. Number one, born on Valentine's Day, 1916 in Staten Island, New York. Number two, studied music at Princeton University and later the Conservatory of Music in Cincinnati. Number three, Began his career as a vocalist with Paul Whiteman's orchestra and later sang with the Gilbert and Sullivan Opera Company. Let's hear a clip. When I was just a wee lad, I ran away to sea. Then I was on the loose, looking for the golden egg from the golden goose. Number four, during World War II, served as a radio operator in the Army. Makes sense, that mellifluous voice. Number five, appeared on Broadway in a number of films and TV shows, often playing serious and professional roles. One of my faves, Cary Grant's attorney in North by Northwest. Number six, one of his mid-50s movies was the universal horror flick Cult to the Cobra, starring Richard Long, David Jansen, Marshall Thompson, Jim Kelly, William Reynolds, quite a cast. Interesting to note that all five of the actors starred or co-starred in 60s hit TV shows. And true to the movie's tale of a curse, Long and Jansen died young. Thompson and Kelly didn't exactly get to be old. And as we'll see, Ed Platt was not long for this world either. Number seven, Platt played the character Chief in the TV show Get Smart from 1965 to 1970. Here's a great story about Platt from TV director Alan Rafkin's memoir. Quote, one of the great things I remember about Get Smart was the actor who played the chief, Edward Platt. He'd been a character actor in movies for years and was well-respected and well-liked. I recalled there were weeks when we couldn't get the show shot in the allotted three and a half days. So once a month, we take an entire day and shoot several episodes worth of the Chief's long speeches to Smart. As tedious as this was, Platt never complained. He was a real trooper. Love finding that nugget. I don't think we should talk right out here in the open, Chief. I think we should use the cone of silence. Oh, Max, every time we use the cone of silence, something terrible happens. Can't you just write it to me on a piece of paper? People can read a piece of paper, Chief. I'll burn it afterwards. Ashes can be reassembled. I'll eat the note. They could operate on you and get it back. <laughs> All right, thanks. Number eight, post Get Smart. Platt appeared at various shows, including an episode of The Odd Couple as Oscars. You guessed it, put out boss. Number nine, married twice, four children. The marriages uniformly described as failed. Number 10, died in 1974, a relatively young man. Later revealed he had committed suicide due to depression and financial pressures. Edward Platt. Our parry for this episode comes from this throwaway line from Mr. Belden. Mr. Basin, I understand that you're the only man in California with the necessary qualifications for the legal action that I have in mind. The question, of course, how 
Is Perry uniquely suited? Mr. Belden doesn't tell us. Perry doesn't say. The unspoken answer, of course, Perry's a Navy man. If that's the case, where's the heavy dose of Perry bio we should be getting in this episode? You'd think we'd get more. No dice. Of course, as many people have pointed out, Raymond Burr, William Hopper, served in the U.S. Navy in real life during World War II. The theme of this episode, slander. I guess people are dogging the moray. By the way, not a great name if you want to avoid the whole slander thing. I realize eels are under the ocean. Work doesn't have exactly great connotations, though, if you know what I mean. So the crew is slandered by everyone except our boy, Captain Jim. His boys, remember? What is it, Jerry? One of my boys in trouble with naval intelligence? Still your boys after three months. The truth While the boys were cheating with Dolores, they didn't kill her. Nope, that was private citizen Gordon Russell trying to crash the government contract party. Now here's some real slander. Anthony M. Belden isn't that smart of a businessman. He invested in Russell? Who's the blind one now? Now, let's go to a Perry proverb. Speaking of Anthony Belden... Let's revisit that early exchange where Belden consults our hero. Della was a flutter at Belden's cash. Mason, not so easily impressed. Give it to him, Barry. Aren't you interested in my fee? Uh, Mr. Belden, I suppose you're accustomed to owning what you pay for. But this entitles you only to my services as counsel. And your attitude has virtually eliminated my inclination and availability. That's right. You don't threaten Mason, bud. He's Justice's boy. Plus, he knows a fool and his money are soon parted. Good luck with Alpha Electronics, Mr. B. Now let's take a swig from the water cooler. You know, there is one thing I don't understand. Go on, Paul. Goodness, it's been a while. Let's share some deleted scenes from today's episode. Thanks to Tom Wiltshire. For contributing these two in the courtroom, Maxwell Smart walks in loudly exclaiming, Chief, Chief! Commander Driscoll looks dismayed and surprised as Smart whispers in his ear. Showing mild irritation, Driscoll says, oh, all right. Smart takes off his shoe, turns to Mason saying, it's for you, Mr. Mason, your secretary calling. Number two. When Mason has Russell on the stand for his slideshow, he puts up a pic of Dolores Chapman and asks Russell to describe the Alpha Electronics device. Sturdy legs, holds his hand up, twisting them in the air, large controls. He points out the support arms, the neck are fully extendable. Oh, boy. Laughter runs through the courtroom. Aaron Hubble has a coughing fit. A trombone plays him off stage. When last we shared a glass of H2O with one another... We mentioned Alfredo's, a restaurant of some repute, in the case of the madcap modiste. All right, I'll I'll see you at Alfredo's at one. We asked, real or fictitious? Aunt Myra did the research. Alfredo's exists, but not in a way that matches this restaurant. Quote, one is a Mexican restaurant, one has pizza. Both have good reviews, but only from a few reviewers. Thanks for doing the legwork, Aunt Mai. No one's calling you, Madcap. Well, we've been off for two months or so, so we've got some listener letters to get to. First, the bad. My bad. Trivia maven Nancy wrote in about the mini pod and let me know that Lenore Sheenwise was in fact in another episode of the show, The Case of the Reckless Rockhound. Well, my only consolation is that It wouldn't have swung the contest in Lenore's favor anyway, but boy, was that embarrassing. Next, we heard from Kimberly Cohen, who writes in with this intriguing question, quote, hi, maybe you have an answer for us. All the judges on the show have a gavel except one. We refer to him as Judge Pencil. When he wants to have order, he taps a yellow pencil on his desk. Why? I don't know, but it's such a good question, Kimberly. If some Perry expert knows the answer, let me know. This is the sort of thing I love to hear about. Thanks for writing. Ask me more weird questions about things you've noticed watching Perry over and over again. That delights me to no end. 
Finally, a nice note from Anita, who sent an email to ask if I was still around last month. Yep. And when I told her I'd taken a break to finish my semester, she sent this note, quote, I really enjoy the Perry Pods and your subtle humor. It's like you record them in a small, dimly lit room after midnight, like only the very serious Perry fans would dare to be awake. I notice you use the word schnook quite a bit. It's a favorite term from my childhood. I wonder how many heads it goes over, but it cracks me up every time. Thanks so much, Anita. Fun fact. That recording vibe comes from the fact that many times I am, in fact, writing and recording from a dimly lit room in my home before my family gets up. Think 5 or 6 a.m. So I'm not a late night man like Paul Drake, more of an early morning person like one assumes Della Street is. As always, if you have a question or comment on this episode or the show in general, you can drop me a line at theperrypot at gmail.com. Join us next time as... Jack Burke plays a prosecutor and Perry plays parent finder to a forlorn orphan. It's the case of the ominous outcast. Join us, won't you? Until then, it's Jonathan Searcy saying, keep on walking that Park Avenue beat. (laughs) 